What is the greatest sequel to a video game? Specifically, what is the best follow-up to the first game in a franchise? Is it Mass Effect 2? Halo 2? Diablo 2? Portal 2? If I were to try and be objective, I would say it would probably be Half-Life 2. Though some people would argue against that, to my bewilderment. Whatever your choice may be, it is most likely a referendum on how well the second game evolved the formula from the previous game. What aspects of the core formula did the game designers risk updating, and what remains the same? Whatever game achieves the greatest balance tends to receive the greatest amount of glory. But what about the games that, boldly, toss away so much of what made the previous game work? Where it's not about achieving a balance, but breaking new artistic ground. I have found that those types of games split their audience down the middle. Games like Final Fantasy VIII, Ninja Theory's Devil May Cry, The Last of Us Part II, those games have their die-hard defenders and detractors. While it's hard enough to establish an objective standard regarding what sequel is the greatest, it's even harder when you factor in those that make bold game design choices and whether or not those choices paid off. The hardest question is determining which gaming sequel is the boldest, and whether or not it succeeded in fulfilling its ambitions. Allow me to argue the case for Chrono Cross. How could Chrono Cross ever surpass Chrono Trigger? Chrono Trigger, to me and the wider gaming public, is a perfect game. I think if the sequel to Trigger were handled by any other developer, they would have followed the tried and true formula of maintaining what works but updating where necessary. But Chrono Cross did not do this. Aside from the fact that this game takes place in the same universe as Chrono Trigger, and makes occasional allusions to that game, the majority of it is a complete reinvention. The combat system makes a drastic departure from the simple yet intuitive combat in Trigger to the resource and luck-based system in Cross. The reaction to this change was akin to the introduction of the Junction system in Final Fantasy VIII. Some people were militant against it, but some think it's the best combat system in the series. The divided reaction carries over to other things, like the number of playable characters. Trigger has seven. Cross has a staggering 45. Then there's the way the narrative was presented. Much like, say, Metal Gear Solid 2's story, some thought it was too convoluted, others, including myself, thought it was brilliant. Are these changes good or bad? Well, there's no definitive answer to that question. Ultimately, whether or not you enjoyed Chrono Cross, I think it deserves at least a modicum of respect for making the bold decisions that it did. Especially because that boldness wasn't careless, like it is with so many other beloved franchises. Even if the changes in Cross aren't your cup of tea, you have to acknowledge the amount of effort put into those changes, along with every other aspect of the game. The music sticks in your head, just like it did with Trigger. The art style somehow manages to be breathtaking despite its origins from the PS1 era. The gameplay, though not as tight as it is in Trigger, and definitely more complicated, is still functional and fun. While I personally think that Cross is almost all around a step down in quality from Trigger, Cross is still state of the art. But if there is one thing that I think Cross definitively does better than Trigger, it would have to be its continuation of the first game's existentialist theme. You know, when I did my video on Chrono Trigger a couple of months ago, I had some people tell me that I was trying to force existentialism into a game that didn't have it. I wish I had played Chrono Cross before I made that video, because Cross completely validated my intuitions. Though the existentialist themes of identity, free will, and fate were more difficult to uncover in Trigger, they are not only confirmed, but built upon to perfection in Cross. Where most other existentialist authors would traumatize their readers and viewers with emotionally difficult questions, Chrono Trigger was unique in that it offered an unusually, triumphantly positive message. Even when your life seems to be in dire straits, and it seems you are fated to tumble forward into oblivion, the one thing you will always have control over is your attitude. 
Staying true to yourself and clinging to a higher morality in the most difficult moments is how you live the best life. And best of all, the power to do that is in the hands of every human being. Though Chrono Cross holds true to that message, it offers up its fair share of powerful arguments against it. Simply put, even the noble act of standing tall in the face of immeasurable suffering can have its negative side effects. Are there times where asserting your will against fate impedes upon the will of others? Are there times where it is simply better to accept that fated oblivion in order to prevent something worse? In all the existential media I have ever encountered, these types of brilliant questions never came up outside of Chrono Cross. We will go through all those questions, but before we do, I think it will be useful to provide a brief synopsis for those who know nothing of either Chrono Trigger or Chrono Cross's story. Doing so will help make the discussion of those existential questions easier to understand. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. Chrono Cross takes place in a tropical archipelago named El Nido, and focuses mainly on the story of a 17-year-old man named Serge. One day, Serge ventures off to a nearby beach where he is, somehow, transported to an alternate dimension. At first, there does not seem to be much different about this dimension compared to the one Serge left. But slowly, minor differences make themselves apparent, leading up to the most shocking revelation of all. In this new dimension, Serge died 10 years prior in a drowning accident. Despite Serge's supposed death, there are mysterious characters in this new dimension who somehow know about our Surge, who is obviously very much alive. More interestingly, is that Surge's mere existence seems to be of cataclysmic importance to these mysterious characters. While trying to figure out who these characters are, Surge encounters another character named Kid, who is seeking out these same people but for a different reason. Those characters would seemingly provide clues as to the location of a legendary, powerful treasure known as the Frozen Flame. Seeing that they have common interests, both Kid and Surge team up to secure the Frozen Flame and discover the truth behind Surge's death. Now before I continue explaining Chrono Cross's story and the philosophical questions that that story elicits, I need to say two things. As someone who has spent a lot of time on YouTube explaining really difficult intellectual narratives and concepts, I have to say that Chrono Cross proved to be a real challenge. In some respects, Chrono Cross makes Dark Souls lore look like the story of Pac-Man. While I believe that I can explain Cross's story to newcomers, be warned that a knowledge of Chrono Trigger's story, while not completely necessary, will help you understand things faster. If you want a quick introduction, watching my video on Chrono Trigger should be sufficient. As I alluded to in that video, and earlier on in this video, the central problem of both Chrono games is fate. Though Chrono Cross confirms that human beings do have free will and can use it to transcend fate, both games suggest that there might be certain instances where, no matter how hard you try, there are some fates you can't avoid. And even if you can avoid them, it might be better not to. I'm not even talking about death here, by the way, because there is a pathway to immortality in Chrono Cross that I will present later. What I refer to is the fate of the Lovecraftian main villain in Chrono Trigger, Lavos, as well as its prisoner, Scala, princess of the former kingdom of Zeal. Unlike all the other characters from Chrono Trigger, Scala's fate was left bitterly unresolved. When Lavos was awakened in 12,000 BC, this transported several characters, including Scala, to various points in time. Scala was transported to the same place that Lavos was banished to at the end of the game, an area outside of fourth dimensional space known as the Darkness Beyond Time. One of the 13 endings you can achieve in Chrono Trigger involves you going to this dimension to try and save Scala, but as you find out, no matter how hard you try, this cannot be done. This drives Scala's brother, Magus, to despair. If he cannot save his sister, what point is there for him to live in this world? Magus's response to this conundrum reflects Chrono Trigger's central message. 
he does not accept this fate, but instead chooses to fade away into the void. If a piece of Magus somehow remained, he hoped that it would birth a world that makes more sense than the one he left. His success in doing so is one of many examples in Trigger of the universe literally bending to the will of human beings. Though Magus was unable to save Scala, the fact that Magus could do something as impossible as will another existence into being shows that maybe somebody else with an equally strong will could be the one to save Scala. This task was taken up by one of the three wise men from Trigger, Balthazar. He, like Scala, was one of the people to be transported to random points in time when Labos awakened briefly in 12,000 BC. He ended up in the year 2300 AD. After arriving there, he discovered the aforementioned Frozen Flame, which turned out to be a splinter of Lavos that crash-landed in El Nido, back when Lavos crash-landed on the planet back in 65 million BC. Balthazar used the Frozen Flame to power a new temporal institute, one which he called Chronopolis. Once Chronopolis was fully operational, he used his Frozen Flame-powered technology to discover that Scala and Lavos were still alive in the darkness beyond time. Worse yet, he found out that they were fused together into a new being called the Time Devourer, which when fully matured would devour all of space-time. Balthazar faced an unusually impossible challenge. He not only had to find a way to separate Scala from Lavos, but had to find a way to do so without letting Lavos out of its dimensional prison. Balthazar did find a way to do this, but it involved creating a plan so convoluted that not even Lavos could anticipate it. While it is possible to understand his plan, trying to explain the specific details here would be like trying to explain the plot of Xenosaga to a six-year-old. Again, I will only explain it insofar as it helps address Chrono Cross's existential theme. To save Scala and destroy the Time Devourer, Belazar planned to open up a wormhole from 2300 AD back to 12,000 BC, so that Chronopolis could be sucked back there. Then, he would use the sentient supercomputer powering Chronopolis, known as Fate, to birth an archipelago in the El Nido Sea, where humans would live. The lives of these humans would be unconsciously guided by Fate which is made possible by way of the save points seen throughout the game, literally known as Records of Fate. This was all done to ensure that Surge, this one human amongst billions born over tens of thousands of years, could live to help carry out Balthazar's plan. However, Surge's life was threatened twice between his birth and the time he would go and kill the Time Devourer. At the age of three, Surge was wounded by a panther demon. His father, Wazuki, along with his friend Miguel, took to sea in the hopes that they could find someone to save Surge from his wounds. Scala somehow heard Surge's cries of pain from across time, which motivated her to, somehow, blow Wazuki's ship off course via a magnetic storm, which would drive them to Gronopolis. There, Surge would come in contact with the Frozen Flame, which would not only heal him, but render him its sole arbiter. What this means is that only Surge could gain access to and power the Frozen Flame, which led to Chronopolis being shut down as a consequence. The second time Surge's life was threatened was when he almost drowned at the age of seven. But remember, that was in an alternate dimension. The dimension in which Surge survived was made possible by Balthazar sending Kid back in time to save Surge at this precise moment. The existence of a dimension where Surge lived somehow made it possible for the Time Devourer to travel into that timeline from the darkness beyond time so he could destroy all that existed. This was necessary, however, so that Surge could use the shards of two Dragon Tears to defeat the Time Devourer. One tier represented love, and the other represented hate. Combined together, these tiers formed the titular Chrono Cross. Confused? Yeah. I'm still confused by certain elements of Chrono Cross's story. 
You will have to beat your head against this game quite a bit before you wrap your head around it. But once you get the picture, you understand, to a certain extent, why the story had to be this complicated. If it wasn't, the existential questions it elicits wouldn't have been possible. Recall what I said before about there being negative consequences to asserting one's will against fate, and how that might impede upon the will of others. This is seen most prominently with the Fate supercomputer. Remember, the lives of those in the El Nido archipelago were completely guided by this computer so that the necessary preconditions could be met to birth Surge and have him destroy Lavos. The negative consequence of this is that the billions of humans preceding Surge had their free will rendered null and void. Even if this was done to save the universe, was it worth depriving billions of humans of their free will to do so? Are each of those lives nothing but a cheap sacrifice just so the one chosen life form can be born? This question is made even more complicated via the conflict between humans and the other species in El Nido, namely the fairies, the dwarves, and the demi-humans. These three species are all resentful towards human beings for either driving them off their homelands or mistreating nature say by driving the dwarves' beloved Hydra species to extinction. The human tendency to do this in the world of Chrono Cross is attributed to the fact that human beings are paradoxical. Now what do I mean by this? Well, in Cross, humans are revealed to be, in part, the progeny of Lavos, due to coming in contact with it during ancient times. It is Lavos that allowed for human beings to evolve from the apes that they were, living in harmony with nature, to being at the top of the food chain and laying waste to nature. This made them paradoxical in the sense that they were a product of nature and capable of love, but also capable of feeling hate and destroying nature. Though the Fate computer permitted human beings to exist and thrive, it was done at great cost to many other species and the environment. The cost was so great that, in a sense, fate needed to be protected so that human beings could survive against several species that wanted revenge on them. Remember those characters that were trying to capture Surge when I gave my brief synopsis of the story? They needed Surge in order to gain access to the Frozen Flame and repower Chronopolis. We instinctively cast them as villains, but they are only trying to capture Surge so that they could gain control over the flame before others did, those that would wish humanity harm. But was this the right thing to do? Is preserving humanity at the cost of their free will and the lives of other sentient creatures worth it? Is humanity worth saving if they are biologically in part like that of the destructive Lavos? Sure, it's all well and good to try and break the bonds of fate via extreme demonstrations of one's free will, but can the cost of doing so be so great that it would be better to submit to fate? That it would be better for Lavos to destroy everything? This question is explored in other ways throughout Chrono Cross. One such example includes Luca, a character from the first game. She was responsible for not only helping banish Lavos to the darkness beyond time, but also for helping carry out Balthazar's plan. Luca helped raise Kid so that she would grow up to travel through time in order to save Surge from drowning. At one point later on in the story, Kid reads a letter from Luca where she contemplates whether or not what she was doing was the right thing. Quote, It is true that thanks to our altering the flow of history, we were able to save so many lives and prevent so much sadness and suffering. But when you think of it, we also caused the deaths of so many that were meant to have come into existence in the timeline we destroyed, and also caused new sadness and suffering further along in the new future we created. That is why I worry that someone might seek revenge on us for what we did. I've had a constant dread in my heart that someone in our new future will travel back in time, just like we did, and try and kill or capture my friends and me. What all of this demonstrates is that there is a faded negative side to every positive action we take, and sometimes, maybe that positive action isn't worth the negative repercussion. One character, near the end of the game, 
puts the emotional difficulty of this problem of fate in the clearest perspective. Quote, In order to survive, all living things in this world fight desperately and devour those they defeat. Must one kill other living beings in order to survive? Must one destroy another world in order to allow one's own world to continue? These are very difficult questions. If it is humanity's fate to kill and destroy to survive, it would be easier if we knew the rules we must abide by in order to live the best life possible given this fate. But as the character Miguel succinctly puts it, life is a game of which we do not know the rules. It's a perspective that echoes the existential concept of thrownness, a concept whose roots reach back at least as far as Blaise Pascal and was virtually codified by Martin Heidegger. When we are thrown into life, we are doomed to suffer, some of us in more perverse and horrific ways than others. On top of this, we are given the freedom to respond to this suffering however we want, a freedom that can either be a blessing or a burden. While there are a multitude of potential responses, they generally fall into two categories. Do we affirm life or reject life? But Chrono Cross offers a third choice. When Surge was saved by Kid and the dimensional split occurred, a major change happened in the area where Chronopolis was once located, an area called the Sea of Eden. In the world where Surge died, Chronopolis remained, but in the world where Surge lived, there was something different. When the cast of characters from Chrono Trigger defeated Lavos, the timeline where Lavos won did not cease to exist. It was merely discarded, and its remnants rest in the Sea of Eden, which was renamed the Dead Sea following this temporal distortion. Though calling it the Dead Sea is appropriate because the timeline where Lavos won is technically dead, it's also illogical because those who exist in the Dead Sea are unable to die, or live. One such character who exists there is the man who accompanied Surge's father when he was seeking out medical attention for Surge as a child, that being Miguel. We encounter Miguel in the Dead Sea, in an area that looks much like the area surrounding Lean's Bell from the first game. He speaks to us about the idea of thrownness, about how life is a game without any clear rules. Instead of choosing to embrace life or reject life, Miguel chooses a third option. He chooses the Dead Sea, where nothing lives or dies, where nothing has to be killed so that one may survive. This is a really interesting concept, one that I've never come across in the realm of sci-fi fantasy. What if a dead timeline could exist where everything was in stasis, granting an immortality that was once confined to the religious notion of heaven? For some, especially the religious, such a notion would seem like the greatest prize. But is it? Should a biological being, destined to live and die, desire to exist in such a dimension? Once again, there is a negative side to everything. If Surge and the other party members chose to exist in this dimension, that would forsake the fates of all others in the universe. He, like every other human being in the universe, plays a causal role in fulfilling humanity's destiny like a link in an infinite cosmic chain, or a wave of spermatozoa pushing a single sperm towards the egg. The ending of Chrono Cross proves as much. At the end of the game, Kid speaks to Surge about the purpose each human life serves. She references the billions of people who lived just so Surge could be born and save the universe. She asks the question I asked all of you prior, are each of those lives nothing but a cheap sacrifice just so the one chosen life form can be born? Her response is no. To paraphrase Kid, every life form that attempts to live a good life for itself forms a link in that infinite cosmic chain. There is no such thing as a useless life form, no such thing as a pawn, and that is why we must not only accept and preserve life, but use the unique human ability to choose life. Regardless of whether or not that choice was predetermined or a consequence of free will, the infinite meaning of that choice 
will sustain us. Where Chrono Trigger taught us how to sustain ourselves in the face of great suffering, Chrono Cross taught us why we should. Ensuring the continuation of not just your life, but the lives of others has a cosmic meaning. This is a great responsibility, one that borders on a burden, and yet, human beings are uniquely equipped to handle it. That is because we are paradoxes of love and hate, like the titular Chrono Cross. And we need to be this way, because the greatest love can only be possible if it is defined against the greatest hate, just as light can only shine its brightest against the greatest darkness. The power of that love, like the power of the Chrono Cross, can make all things possible, including something as seemingly impossible as saving Scala, which, in the end, Surge chose to do. Special thanks to Gaming University for looking over the script for this video. Before you go, make sure you hit that like button. It's simple, easy to do, and helps me out a lot. Until next time, stay yellow.